Hi, Aubrey. Great to see you again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm Dr. Aubrey de Grey. I work on aging. I'm not in favor of it. I am trying to fix it. And I uh, lead a nonprofit based in California named LEV Foundation. Uh, we are focusing on mouse experiments, trying to uh, bring aging under really comprehensive medical control in mice, especially with treatments that are truly rejuvenating. In other words, we start with middle-aged mice, and we're interested in um, making them biologically younger and therefore living healthy for longer and therefore living for longer. And it's going okay. Uh, how did you get interested in aging? I got interested in aging rather late in life, actually. I was already 30. I mean, of course, a lot of people don't get interested until they start suffering from aging. Um, but uh, yeah, for me, I'd always known that aging was the world's most important problem. The thing I didn't know until about the age of 30 was that other people didn't think that way. I um, went into artificial intelligence research at first, and while I was doing that, I met and married a biologist. And it turned out she wasn't interested in aging. And it turned out all the other biologists that I was meeting through her were also not interested. And I thought, well, that won't do, so I switched fields. Mm -hmm. And how did that go? Well, <laughs> um, I guess I did all right. I mean, um, I already knew that um, there was quite a distinguished history of people who switch fields doing well in science. Like the whole of molecular biology was invented in the 1950s by a bunch of physicists. Um, and so I, you know, I'd done all right in my AI research, and I thought, well, okay, I know how to work on really hard problems. And I come in like not so encumbered by the conventional wisdom, so to speak. Maybe I'll have some new ideas, and that's what happened. I, um, you know, about five years in, I guess, in the year 2000, I had this kind of eureka moment of realizing that reversing aging by repairing the damage that the body does to itself throughout life is actually going to be easier than slowing aging down, which is what everyone else had been focusing on. And that took a long time to be accepted as even remotely plausible, but now it's a pretty mainstream idea. That would be the strategies for engineering negligible senescence. Exactly that, yes. I, um, I, I crystallized it into a system of seven different categories of damage, each of which the, I, I talked about a particular um, <clears throat> generic method for how we might actually implement this damage repair, this maintenance. And uh, yeah, so that's basically stood the test of time pretty well. It was kind of, you know, in 2013, there was this very famous paper called The Hallmarks of Aging, which was, um, which is by far the most highly cited paper in the whole field of the whole century. And um, it's essentially a rehash of what I said 10 years earlier before Hallmarks were cool. Mm -hmm. And of these seven categories <clears throat> that you delineated in the original paper in 2000, how do, it's been 24 years, it's the year 2024, closing in on 2025. Which do you think are the most promising and the least promising of the seven categories? Well, first of all, I want to emphasize that that's the wrong question, because the whole point of this approach is it's a divide and conquer approach, and we can't just leave any of them like behind. We can't just prioritize each of them, uh, between them. We can, however, prioritize within them. One thing that has happened very much in the past 24 years is that alternative approaches for each of the categories have come along. So to, just to illustrate, um, one of the categories is cell loss, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. And 24 years ago, the only way we had that might even slightly be plausible to do anything about that was stem cell therapy. You put in new stem cells that divide and differentiate to replace the cells that the body is not replacing on its own. But now we have this thing called partial reprogramming, where the cells that are already in the body, the resident cells, can be rejuvenated and made more regenerative, more stem-like. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's in, that may end up being a much more practical alternative. Um, yeah, and if I look at some of the other categories, you know, the same thing has happened. We've got multiple approaches that look promising now. So in that sense, yes, absolutely, um, you know, we've got kind of a league table. And it keeps shifting, of course, as progress gets made in any particular technology. But we should not be considering any kind of hierarchy um, as between the categories themselves, because we've got to do all of them. And actually, that has really been a, a strong emphasis of most of my time, most of the work I've done over the past 20 years, is to make sure that the most difficult categories, the ones where 
none of the approaches are particularly easy to actually implement um, are not neglected. Because, you know, basically people in academia and also people in industry um, are terribly short-termists, right? They, they have enormous pressure to get results quickly. Um, and therefore, they'll always be biased in favor of doing the low-hanging fruit. And the things that are a little bit more difficult will get neglected, and that won't do in this case. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the most exciting developments that you see happening in the next five to ten years? Well, I think we've got a pretty good chance in the next five years or so of really cracking aging in mice. In other words, the kind of experiments that we're doing now um, to combine a whole bunch of different interventions in middle-aged mice and get them to live longer, I believe that we've got a very good chance within the next five years of getting those things to um, achieve an, am a qu a d an amount of life extension that is completely out of sight compared to what anyone's achieved so far with simpler approaches. At the moment, if you take a typical mouse, which would normally live on average about two and a half years, and you wait until it's one and a half years old before you do anything to it at all, so that's what I meant by middle age, right? So they're not yet sick, but they're not very far away from becoming sick. Um, if you throw whatever you like at them at this point, the best you can get is about four months of additional life. So supposing you could get a whole year, that's three times the effect size, right? That's what we're aiming for, and we believe that that will be enough to completely change society's attitude to aging and, and its malleability for humans. It'll still obviously be a little while after that before, um, before the corresponding amount of progress is made in humans themselves, which I would say would be something like getting 20 years of postponement of the health problems of late life. Um, but people will at least be trying, whereas now they're not really trying. And do you see this as being a single intervention or a combination of interventions to get to the one-year extension on the mouse? It will definitely be a combination. And in fact, it might be a big combination. We, um, we did four interventions in the study that we're doing right now that started early last year, and it hasn't really cracked it. If, we, uh, if, if, if I want to take a single takeaway from the first study that we're, we've done that is nearly complete now, then it would be that we're probably not hitting enough of the bases. We're not hitting, you know, we're not sufficiently comprehensive. Um, and therefore, we probably need to try six or eight interventions together rather than four. And when, without a single element, it's, it's the weakest link, right? That's well, right. the idea? That's, that, this is it, yes. I mean, you've got all of these various types of damage accumulating in the body, and they all transition into actual functional decline of one kind or another at around the same age. That's kind of a, an, a, an immediate consequence of evolutionary pressure. Like, uh, you know, there's no point in, in um, having machinery to, to have one type of um, damage accumulate unnecessarily slowly if everything else is going to kill you first, right? Um, so they all kind of equal out in terms of how, in terms of the age at which they become pathogenic. And that means that unless you, hit, unless you slow down all of them, you're going to die of something fairly soon, you know, at pretty much the same age that you die at the moment of, of one or other of these things. So yes, that's why we have to hit all of them. And when you're assuming that you're successful with stacking four to eight interventions to get the one year plus uh, increase in lifespan and hopefully health span of these mice. Yep. How do you see the thesis on translation when there are so many different distinct mechanisms between mouse and human? <clears throat> so there's an enormous culture change that will be required with regard to the medical profession. At the moment, you know, medics know perfectly well that they are experimenting, that they, they're essentially, you know, using a lot of trial and error to get anything to work at all because each individual is different and so on. And so they try to keep things simple. People really don't like giving combination therapies at all, but we're just gonna have to bite that bullet. And I think when it is seen that it can work in an organism that you know, is a bit like us, you know, it's got four limbs and fur and stuff, then um, you know, it's going to be enough of a, an incentive to actually bite that bullet and actually, try, actually um, you know, design not just the actual clinical approach, but also the regulatory approach for approval of things, um, so as to ensure that, um, that such treatments can be developed in a timely fashion and, and made available. Mm -hmm. Well, given we're at the biomarkers of uh, aging conference, 
do you have particular faith in a specific single biomarker? Absolutely not. At this point, um, you know, there's enormous progress and, of course, enormous excitement right now with regard to the modern biomarkers of aging, the epigenetic ones, the proteomic ones, and so on. And, um, you know, there's, there's great progress being made. I would say that right now, the, there's still a little way to go to get those biomarkers really ready for prime time, and really uh, to, to be an improvement on the more traditional things, the functional ones like, you know, gait speed and um, grip strength and, and cognitive um, measures. Uh, but they probably will get there. However, the biggest challenge is to develop biomarkers that can be surrogates of clinical outcomes for interventions. At the moment, we, you know, we've moved on from the original first generation clocks that could basically tell you how old you were, which you kind of knew already, right? To the second generation ones, which are pretty good at telling you, telling you how biologically old you are, how soon you're going to start exhibiting the health problems of late life. But that's all in the context of no interventions. What we need is clocks that can be used to say, well, okay, you take this intervention, if the clock goes down, you can be really quite sure that it is going to, um, that the intervention is going to extend your healthy life. And if it doesn't, you can be reasonably sure that it's not going to extend your healthy life. We are nowhere near that yet. Mm -hmm. And if people want to learn more, what would you recommend they would be pursuing? Well, I mean, um, it's a question of what one wants to learn more about, of course. But if you want to learn more about the ways in which we are going to achieve longevity escape velocity and actually bring aging under comprehensive medical control, then definitely start by coming to our website, levf.org, um, and looking at the studies we're doing. Uh, I wrote a book a decade or more ago, in fact, 15 years ago, um, uh, which describes the seven-point plan, the seven deadly things, as I call them, um, and, and what we might do about them. That book is in severe need of being updated, but uh, it's still, it's, it, what, what's in there is not wrong. It's all stood the test of time. It just, you know, there's more to say now. Uh, so, yeah, those are good places to start. Thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you.